but hi everybody. My name is Gabrielle. I am a clinical dietitian um, at a major hospital in New York City. Um, I'm going to go over today the trials and tribulations of being a clinical dietitian and the pathway towards my success and some just general tips on if you're interested in clinical, um, how to find your own success as well. So um, the first slide is basically just about my background. I graduated from Penn State in 2012 and I completed my dietetic internship at Cornell in Ithaca in 2013. I have a double master's or bachelor's in clinical nutrition and journalism, and I have a master's in clinical nutrition. And I've always wanted my dream was to combine both my journalism degree and clinical nutrition degree. And you'll see in this next few slides that it took me a very long time to get there. Um, so after my schooling, I had that really scary moment that we all experience at one point in our lives with the now what. And it was, you know, after that long path of elementary towards college, and you knew exactly where you were going, that moment hit me like a brick. And I thought to myself, after this dietetic internship, I have an idea of where I want to specialize in, I know exactly what to do. And that just simply didn't happen. So I ended up moving back in with my parents, and they were really excited about that. Um, back in Pittsburgh, and I found my first clinical job um, within a few months of passing my exam um, at a large hospital in Pittsburgh. And it was a kind of a, a temporary position. I was taking staff relief, and a lot of people look at staff relief jobs and temporary jobs as not so great. Um, and I actually looked at it myself like that at first, and I realized that these jobs really give you a lot um, in terms of experience, especially as a dietitian that's just starting, and you get to meet people in these large facilities that you might not have gotten access to in other situations. So I worked there for about six months, and I was covering cardiac and esophagectomy patients. And then after my contract was over, I followed my heart and my boyfriend to New Jersey. And I found this very interesting role as the second dietitian in a small community hospital in Trenton, New Jersey. And I looked at the dietitian that hired me on as who was going to be my mentor for the first few years starting out. Um, but little did I know that right after she started training me, she let me know that she was leaving. And this was a big, another scary moment in my life where I realized that I would be covering the entire hospital, 350 beds by myself after starting my own, you know, clinical path. So I just finished my dietetic internship and now I'm covering the entire hospital by myself. And this was scary. And I realized that there's power in asking questions. Um, there's power in finding resources for learning, um, no matter how you do it, through Aspen or through the Academy. Um, there are people out there that will help you. And I managed to cover this hospital for a good six to seven months by myself. Um, ICU, um, we had a lot of cardiac patients and just general medicine. Um, the hospital is also very interesting because it had an incarceration unit um, where they would take inmates from the state prisons who needed medical care. And this was a really interesting experience as a clinical dietitian because you got to see some other aspects of hospital care. Um, one of our patients, actually a few of them would come in with hunger strikes. Um, because they didn't want to go back to the prison. So as long as they weren't eating and they required this medical care, they wouldn't go back to the prison. And physicians would look to the dietitians to help them try to get the patient to eat. And we weren't trained for this in our dietetic internship, but I did learn counseling skills. And as long as you, you know, establish rapport with patients, the better off you'll be at helping them to change their ways or meet a mutual understanding. So that was a very challenging piece in itself. Um, later on, our hospital actually was acquired the nutrition department by an outside company. So sometimes hospitals um, are self-run 
their kitchen is self-run by the hospital organization, or sometimes companies like Sodexo um, or Morrison will come in and take over the lead on nutrition and food services. And when that happened, we had two more dietitians come on board and we all became really good friends. And um, I learned a lot from them as well. Um, eventually one of those dietitians became my lead dietitian and my boss. So that was pretty interesting to have that dynamic from, you know, a colleague that's your friend to become your boss. Um, so that was something unique um, experience. And then I decided at some point to get my master's. I realized that a lot of the clinical jobs today are actually requiring master's now. Um, so I wanted to get ahead of the game on that back in, I think this was 2016. Um, so I moved to New York, New York City um, and I completed my master's at NYU. And I had to get a job while I was there to just afford water, basically. <laughs> Everything is so expensive here. So I ended up taking a temp job at a large hospital here in New York City. And it was really humbling because I was back at square one. Um, and whenever you start a new job in clinical setting, um, a lot of times the new employees are put at the bottom of the list for things like uh, vacation time and weekend scheduling. Um, so I was humbled but I was also really excited to be working in a big city like this. Um, and once again, I was learning from all the dietitians I was covering on the staff relief situation. Um, and I eventually ended up back in cardiac again. Um, so I'm not quite sure how that keeps happening to me, but it does. And I started to really love the cardiac population. I finally landed my favorite job and my dream job um, at a new hospital, which is another major one um, in the city. Um, and now I work with the advanced heart failure patients. I do LVAD, if you guys are aware of what that is. It's basically a, a device that they implant in the patient for end-stage heart failure that helps their heart pump fluids um, through the ventricles. And this kind of gives the patient a few more years um, or helps them bridge to the transplant. Um, and I helped my hospital um, establish their transplant program here. So um, it's been very rewarding. Um, I love this career very much. And I just wanted to just mention how long it might take to get to where you really want to be. But every step along the way is a good experience and a good um, learning um, opportunity to bring into your next job. So more on my current position, um, I mentioned I work with the heart failure population. Um, during this role, I helped to establish a protocol here called the ERAS protocol. And as a clinical dietitian, um, sometimes we think that we're very limited in what we can do. Um, but I realized that um, things like new protocols that we could um, implement can help us better the hospital care and make a true impact on our patients. Um, so this ERAS protocol is basically a pre-op um, situation where we want to optimize the patient as much as possible to help their recovery after their transplant or their LVAD. And our piece in this is catching them as soon as possible to avoid frailty or to improve on their frailty before their, their um, surgery. Um, and we also give them these special drinks that are filled with carbohydrate, easily digested carbohydrate. Um, we pre-optimize them by having them drink three of those right before their procedure, the night before. And um, theoretically, this pushes the body into an anabol anabolic state um, to decrease the stress response after surgery and help them build strength and muscle immediately afterwards. So it's really exciting and the science behind clinical nutrition is so fascinating and so ongoing and improving every day that working in hospitals like this, you can really see it take effect on your patients. Um, other roles that I do in the hospital, I'm now a senior dietitian here. So as a senior dietitian, you guys might be asked to be advanced someday. Um, we do a lot of QA for our staff. We do annual presentations for the team, and I do some mentorships for my fellow colleagues. 
Um, I also have been asked to do media representation for our hospital in things like news articles. Um, I did a podcast this year and also panel discussions with the community. So it's not just about bedside care. Uh, this is just a typical picture of the day in the life of a clinical dietitian. Uh, so we usually come in in the morning, we do our screening, and this is where you look for patients that are at risk for malnutrition or who may need help with nutrition. Um, things like tube feeds or parenteral nutrition um, or patients that have cachexia and the doctors think they have failure to thrive. We'll see them that day and we'll look for them during the screening process. We then go on to the units and we start rounding with the physicians and the medical teams. And we also visit with the patients ourselves. Afterwards, we do a lot of charting and clinical nutrition is full of charting in the medical record. So if you like the type, <laughs> this might be the job for you. Um, it's a lot of typing, but it's also just very, um, it's important. Um, afterwards, I sometimes attend meetings. So we do have staff meetings, patient meetings with families. Um, I do selection meetings for our transplant group. So we have these big meetings where every discipline, we have psych, social work, clinical nutrition, um, we have like a patient representative and then we have the surgeons come together and they present this patient to the surgeon um, to see if they are eligible for transplant. And usually I'm there vouching for these patients who may be struggling with nutrition um, and teaching them how we've been able to optimize them prior to the procedure. So it's a really exciting meeting to attend um, except for the fact that it's at 7 a.m. because the surgeons go into the surgery center at eight. So we have to be up early. Uh, I have some tips for success in the clinical setting. One is never to stop learning. Um, we are constantly learning on our job because the science is always changing and we always have patients coming in with something that curveballs up to us that we've never seen before. So I always look for online seminars, um, things from A&D, Aspen, um, conferences like FENCI every year, which is our national conference, um, or even overseas. Um, some of my colleagues have gone to places like Italy, France, um, to meet up with other dietitians from around the world. Um, and that's really, really cool and such a great learning experience. Um, looking for other hospital series in your hospital or collaborating with other dietitians or disciplines um, like physical therapy, learning more about frailty that way, um, or SLP, the speech pathologist to learn more about swallowing function can always help you learn about how your patients are feeling and what they're going through. Um, another thing to think about is letdowns always happen, especially in a hospital setting. And it's hard sometimes at first. I know I struggled with not taking these emotions home um, because sometimes you do get attached to your patients and seeing them go through some really, really hard things can have an impact on yourself. Um, but you want to, number one, keep your eye on the good things that happen for them. Um, keep small goals for them. So meet your patients where they are. When I'm in heart failure, I know these patients have had lifestyles for 30 plus years and they haven't been able to knock some of their hard habits off. Um, and at the end stage of their, their organ dysfunction, they are limited in mobility. They can only walk maybe one to two um, blocks without having to sit down and rest. Um, they can hardly prepare their meals. So we are looking for a small, small, small victories here. Um, and those little victories can add up and it kind of keeps our expectations, both the patient and myself in check. Um, and they do help even if they are pretty small. Um, and lastly is really get to know your patients. Um, a lot of times people, they say, you know, hospital patients, they come and go and you don't really get to establish rapport, but you do. Um, and you can, it's just a matter of looking past the patient's picture on their chart and really getting to know who this person is. Even if you only meet them once, um, you can really have an impact on someone's life for a very long time. I've had patients come back into the hospital remembering discussions we've had 
two years ago and I might not remember them, but the patient really did. And that really means a lot when things like that happen to me. So um, you can make an impact even if it is acute care. This is just a screenshot of like free seminars for the month that Aspen um, is providing. So just an idea of, you know, even if you go to the Aspen website or um, A&D website, there's always something out there for you to learn that you don't even have to pay for. So just something to keep in mind. And just a little bit more. So um, in terms of, you know, what I went through, if you don't have anything, any idea of what you're doing, right, when you get out of your internship, just keep it moving. Um, you're going to figure it out. It's not the end of the world to not have a direction in place yet. Um, when I needed to look for jobs, I kind of scheduled it out like a, like a meeting. And I put it in my calendar as just like this block of time is when I'm going to start applying to jobs. Um, and after a while, you know, that resiliency kind of helped get me where I needed to be. Um, but oftentimes it can take months before a company gets back to you, even if they posted a job opening. So never lose hope on that. Um, also, initial jobs are not always a dream job, but they are learning opportunities for you. So don't look down on something that you might not be super excited about. They're still very good opportunities. Um, whenever you are looking for your job, kind of keep in mind of if you do have an idea of what you want to do in 20 years, what that job description asks for and build your resume around that. So if you want to be a director of a hospital someday, what does that job description on, you know, the job seeker websites ask for, and then try to build that in your own experiences along the way. Um, I think that's something that some of us forget about and we just think about the moment. But if you kind of look at it ahead and see what skills you want to build on, that might help you. You can always make this career what you want. Um, as I said earlier, you don't have to just be bedside. You can start doing um, podcasts or um, use your clinical experience in other ways, which another slide down on this um, slide deck we'll talk about too. And always look for side gigs or volunteering to build your connections with the community and with other fellow dietitians. So this is just a little thing. Um, think outside of the box in terms of clinical nutrition. Next slide. <laughs> So these are just other ideas of ways you can use your clinical experience. So if you get tired with bedside, um, you could go into things like academia. Um, I know one of our previous present presenters talked about academia. My, my colleague just went into teaching and he really loves it. He said that a lot of his experience on bedside really helps him speak to his clinical education sessions that he's giving. And apparently those jobs do pay pretty well too. So just an idea. Um, you could go into IT and software companies. Um, Seaboard, if you guys have heard of Seaboard or Epic are our medical charting programs that we use here. Um, and they're always looking for clinicians um, to join their team and be more on the IT side of things. And a lot of those jobs are remote. Um, but having this background experience will help you get hired for that. Um, additionally, infusion companies are kind of on the same realm. Um, so people that have tube feeds and um, parenteral nutrition, they have companies that help bring that equipment um, to their homes and coordinate with the, the doctors here. Um, so we have um, a few colleagues that went into infusion companies and now they work as representatives for those products. And sometimes they come visit us and they talk to um, our colleagues here about their products and keep us updated on the, the new and improved um, marketing uh, products out there. Um, there are other um, ideas on this slide too, but I can let you guys just read them because they're pretty self-explanatory. And this is just a quick tip for clinical RD interviews. Um, I've been through a lot of them in my, my years here. 
Um, so I would just like to give you guys some ideas of what to prepare for. Um, first of all, do your research about the hospital, um, especially the type of patients they cover, um, how many beds they typically have, um, and what the acuity of the patients are. Um, sometimes the smaller community hospitals have less acuity and they're less sick um, than the larger citywide um, hospitals. So just keeping that in mind going into the interview. Um, I had a very traumatic um, trauma interview one time when I was first starting out and I didn't realize how sick their patients were. Um, and the hiring manager grilled me on very specific illnesses and what I would do in that situation to provide medical care and I was not prepared. And so if you're going into a hospital that specializes in something, really read up on the, the MNT for that just to review in case they do grill you as well. Um, that was one interview I wish I could just do over. <laughs> um, but you know, we live, we learn. Um, consider bringing a portfolio and dressing the part. Um, sometimes I overdress for interviews just to feel better about, you know, going into it and feeling more prepared um, from the outside in. Um, think of specific patient stories or stories that you have instead of just giving blanket statements to their questions. Um, and be honest about your area of interest. Um, be open to sh learning other opportunities, but let hiring managers know where your interests lie. And lastly, do not be afraid to negotiate wage, um, especially now that our careers are, especially in the clinical setting, they want us to get masters. Um, sometimes the pay um, that we see out in the workforce are not meeting what we would be expecting for a master's degree. So do not be afraid to politely negotiate that, even if it is your first job, um, because we need to you know, start helping our own career and our own colleagues um, get better pay. Um, so yeah, that's just a little side mention for me. <laughs> and this is my last slide, but I just wanted to review the power of connections. So the world, the RD world is figuratively small, especially the clinic world. Um, everyone knows each other um, in the city. And actually within, you know, these nationwide conferences, I will know about a dozen full of dietitians that are outside of my own company that go. Um, so be really nice to people that you work with. Um, your old coworkers could be your interviewers um, and your bosses someday down the line, just like mine was. Um, so it's really good to keep those connections going. Use LinkedIn, um, link up with your old professors if you can, just so you have good support system. Um, and, you know, always like, if you can reach out for like groups and volunteering events, do so because you can establish a really nice network that way. And that is it. Um, do you guys have any questions? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. That was so informative. And you've had so much about the interview and process and your day in the life. We have so many great chats going on right now, too. So <laughs> and grab some of these questions. We do have uh, the first question we did get, and you may have um, and answer this, you may not, just depending on the type of internship you did. We did have a question um, if you had any tips for securing clinical rotation sites. I know you have someone on here who you were their preceptor. So that was a really great. <laughs> so you are a preceptor. So do you have any tips on securing clinical rotation sites at all? Yeah, it's, it's getting harder and harder, I know. Um, but I think the most important thing is working with your your counselors at your universities, um, because they are pretty well aware of what schools are looking for. Um, and sitting down one to one with them can actually really help you a lot to kind of gear your your uh, application um, towards whatever school you're, you're hoping for. Um, I would also say it's kind of um, interesting, but like look for programs that are 
um, a little bit more obscure. If you're worried about um, placing an internship and maybe not go for those more um, popular ones because they're all very well established if they're accredited. And it doesn't really matter if they're not like a top notch clinical dietetic internship. Um, companies over don't really look at that part. They're just looking to see if you got your internship. So um, if you're worried, try to go for like one of the more obscure um, uh, programs. Yeah, great tips, thank you. Uh, we do have another question. Um, do you think working in clinical setting and maintaining an online private practice is doable? I don't know if you have colleagues uh, that do that. I know you also do some media work and things on the side. So you also are balancing uh, different types yeah. of Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's important to try to find something extra on the side if you have the means, because sometimes, you know, bedside does take a lot out of you or, or, or it can become, um, you know, just day to day, the same thing over and over again. But I have a lot of colleagues right now that are in um, outpatient clinics on the side. And some of them are only doing maybe one to two days of this and maybe an hour or so every night. But there are companies out there that actually do hire dietitians for that amount of work each week. Um, or you could just open your own practice. Um, there are some steps to that. Um, but once you establish a few clients, it does start getting easier. Um, I've had, I think about, there are 15 of us on staff right now. There's about three to four of us that have clinical outpatient, um, our own practice jobs too. Great, that's great to know. And our last question uh, that we are going to go over for your session is um, actually from your preceptor, if you had any tips on negotiating wage, because that was one of uh, your tips during the interview, not being afraid to negotiate. And we love that and um, advocating for yourself. So do you have any tips on that negotiation process? I would say um, number one is to look at what the, your city, like your, um, there's data out there to see what the baseline pay is for starting dietitians. Try to look at that. Um, do some research around um, what other dietitians are getting paid for in other areas, um, especially for dietitians that have the same background education as you, um, to try to bring some numbers to the table when you are negotiating, um, because that that's probably what's really going to help you there is having hard numbers um, and research behind it. Um, cause you don't want to just go into this and just say, you know, I had my master's. I really, I need to get like all these debts paid and they're not going to really like that. So having as many numbers to back you up as possible can help. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that helps. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly the direction to go in. And I think a lot of students and interns and even dietitians applying for new jobs and negotiating, um, can definitely use that in their negotiations. And I just wanted to know, we have so many great uh, messages here uh, saying thank you. I know a lot of people are interested in the clinical space and are looking to finish their internship. And we have some people that recently finished their clinical rotations, which is so exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, really, really informative session. Thank you so much for sharing all of your experience. Thank you guys.